And then the effect of Buffalo Bill Cody, huge on artists in the United States and Europe. I mean, you can't underemphasize the effect that Buffalo Bill Cody had on Western artists. And then that melds into Western artists and, and Western books having an effect on the Holly, early Hollywood movies. And then the movies then had an effect on artists that, that watched the movies. So it's like art begot the films, and the films begot the art. And, and so it, it kind of completed the, the circle. <laughs> I'm sitting in my messed <laughs> up office with, you can't see anything. It looks really beautiful. But if you look around, it was just popcorn. And <laughs> well, I, I normally am in a sweatshirt and bad old jeans, but I figured I should dress up for you. Nah. Well, you know, it's funny because it does go on YouTube. We put these on YouTube. and you know, Oh, yeah, I've watched a lot of them. And I always tell people, you know, to uh, dress accordingly, however they feel comfortable with, because some people, you know, there's a certain look you want to have. And I know a couple of, I think it was Bob Bose Bell that I had on. I just kind of dragged him out of a meeting for the Western Artists Association. He wasn't dressed like he normally would be. He's like, oh, this is going to be on YouTube too. I go, yeah. He goes, all right, that's fine. So. Yeah, I, I watched that one. I, I love True West and I love him and Stuart Rosebrook. And, and uh, I would imagine going forward, it'd, it'd be a lot easier in a lot of ways to do these Zoom ones than trying to get people into your off or into your gallery. Oh, I love it. You can't, I can't tell you yeah. how much I love it. Yeah, because, yeah, well, one thing I'd have to clean up my uh, office, which I don't want to have to do. So it's, and I have to do that <laughs> periodically. So this way I can just do it anywhere. Uh, I can get guests like yourself. You, you're in uh, Oregon, right? Yeah, Central Oregon by a bend. By the way, we've started the podcast, so we we just get it going. This is Larry oh, okay. Patterson, who's a Peterson. Uh, Peterson I'm sorry, Peterson. <laughs> yeah, no, we, let's get it right. I yeah, do let's have start a, over. Let's let's start no, over. We we you we, we want to know. This is the kind of stuff that they love on oh, YouTube. Oh, right? okay. Larry Lynn Peterson <laughs> Patterson. I have a client named Patterson, so you'll have to excuse me. And when you get a good client that's do, doing nice things for you, you want to remember that name. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So, um, but yeah, it's, uh, you know, you're a really interesting guy. And, uh, you know, you're medicine man as well, which is really kind of fun that there's more than one of us out there. You're the Southern, I'm the Northern. <laughs> that's exactly <laughs> right. Though, in a lot of ways, you're really the more, uh, you know, academician of, of the, the medicine man, because you've really done a lot of not only writing in the Western world in the Native American field, but you also have done some pretty incredible things in your own field as a dermatologist, correct? Yes, I've, I've always enjoyed doing research. So it started early in college. I worked in a biochemistry lab and then a medical genetics lab during uh, medical school and and my dermatology residency, I did an NIH fellowship, and uh, I think I published like 30 papers before I was done it uh, with all my education, scientific papers. You, you had published 30 so, by the time you got out of college? I love college. learning. Wow. Okay, so that tells of, me a uh, lot. Of residency, you. derm residency. Yeah, that tells me a lot already. Yeah, I read one of your papers actually on just to see what was out there. It was on Renault's disease that you had done with patients. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. that was in give, JAMA. Uh, yeah, that yeah. was more well, of a clinical a one. Yeah. yeah, that was very yeah. interesting. So for those who don't know what Renault's disease is, they, your hands and feet and nose get very cold. You're very cold sensitive. You have vasoconstriction problems. And, and so you tortured some patients, it sounded like. <laughs> yeah, I'd, actually, I did that when I was during my internal medicine internship at St. Vincent's Hospital in Portland as if internship wasn't busy enough. I yeah, still yeah. was doing research even then, so. Yeah, that's fantastic, yeah. It tells me so much about you, yeah, that you, you do those kind of things. We're, we're, we have that same, you must have that same sense of you have this much time and it's going like this. Exactly, yeah. I wanna learn, learn like I'll uh, uh, live forever and live like I'll die tomorrow, right? And, yeah. And, and have you always been that way, you think, as a kid? I, you know, I think so. I, um, you know, I was, I think, the earliest 
evidence of that was probably collecting, probably like a lot of people. I collected coins, collected stamps, baseball cards, you know, baseball cards are so huge. And the ones you didn't like, you put in your, with the clothespin, you put in your bicycle spokes and they made sounds as you rode your bicycle, your Swin bicycle. My dad had a hardware store. So um, I got always got a nice Schwinn bicycle because he was the Schwinn dealership until Schwinn got to the point where they said, if you don't sell 300 bicycles a year, we're going to drop you as a franchise. So obviously in Plentywood, Montana, uh -huh. uh, there weren't 300 kids to buy bicycles. So yeah. And that's, yeah. And that's an interesting that place. Where you Schwinn. Up. Yeah. You grew up in a very small town in Montana, right? Yeah, most of the people, you know, most of the population in Montana, like a lot of states, is in the western side. And um, probably a lot of people in Montana, especially new arrivals, don't even know where Plentywood is. But it's right on the Canadian-North Dakota border. Mm -hmm. Historically, it's where Sitting Bull went through when he was after the Custer battle with them. And, and uh, Sitting Bull headed north into Canada, and he went right through you know, across the medicine line, which is the Canadian US border. And, and he went right through my hometown and uh, north of there into Canada. Mm. So it, it, the Missouri is below it about 40 miles. It's plenty of woods 40 miles north of the Missouri. So Lewis and Clark went by there. And mm. there's a lot of historical uh, Western things out there, just like Tucson. Yeah. So, well, yeah, it's, it is in a weird way. Um, and is that Assiniboine and um, Sioux area? Is that what? Exactly. It was Fort Fort Peck Reservation. Right. You know, one time, the the uh, about the entire one fourth northern part of Montana was was the Blackfeet Indian Reservation. It went from Glacier Park to to North Dakota, and right. then to get the Great Northern Railway through there, James J. Hill, uh, the Empire Builder, um, so they shrunk the Blackfeet Reservation, gave them some not great land over by Glacier Park, and then they gave uh, gave them Port Peck Indian Reservation too, and a couple of smaller ones. Was that like but, 1909 or something like that? that they came um, it was earlier than that because yeah, the, sure. the Great Northern was completed in 1893. It was the last transcontinental railway completed. Um, but the Fort Peck Indian Reservation was big for us because a lot of the teams we played in sports were the Indian teams. In fact, um, when I was a senior, I was playing at the, with the Poplar Indians in Poplar, Montana, and uh, blew my knee out. And, mm. uh, you know, and there's probably one doctor within 200 miles. I mean, Billings is 350 miles. You know, there's probably one orthopedist in Billings then. And I remember being taken down to the locker room they asked if there was a doctor in the house because they had to carry me down there. The oh, yeah. doctor that came down had, had one leg. And so that really made me <laughs> comfortable that he, I was going to get some help there. But I just laid in bed for about a month and hobbled around and never had anything done. Was that? Do you think you blew out your ACL? Yeah, I blew out my ACL and medial collateral. When I was at dermatology residence, my orthopedic buddies got a hold of me and wanted to, they, in the old days before all the, cat scans and all that you know they do dye studies so these guys right. didn't know what they were doing and they stuck a needle in my knee without any uh sedation or anesthetic oh, God. and uh and then they wanted to do surgery on me the next day you know it's like i, I don't think so uh -uh. and i'm glad i didn't because you know a lot of guys that in our era that blew their knees out or got torn cartilage they'd slit the knee out. open and take all the cartilage yeah. out and then by the time they're 40 they're all having knee replacements Yep. So I just got to the point where I stayed away from things that, uh, you know, made my knee come out. Yeah. No cut and pivot sports. That's what you need to get out of wood. Right. Exactly. <laughs> I remember all those exactly. things working on those. It's been a, a long, many decades ago, but I still remember drawer tests and all the things that go along. With oh, yeah. With yeah. Knee injuries. So, and, but yeah. you're good now. You're still decent. You know, your knee's okay. Or have you had yeah, it it bother it bothers me sometimes, but you know we have a 160 acre, whatever you call it, ranch, and I do most everything here, so I get a lot of exercise. It's a good balance between that and doing the book research. Yeah. So when you're a kid, you're growing up in rural uh, Montana. You're right around the reservations, so you have you're 
exposed early on, like I was growing up in New Mexico with native culture, I assume, right? Exactly. Yeah, yes. especially with the hardware. Most, most of the, our athletic conference. Yeah. 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 We used to hunt, you know, we go onto the Indian Reservation. Part of the Fort Peck Indian Reservation is in, the name of our county was Sheridan County after, you know, good oh, old yeah. Phil. No the only Indian. good Indian I ever saw was a dead yeah. Indian, so. Yeah, no. Ironic. Yeah. <laughs> anyway. there. Well, you know, growing up in that time, so you, you're pro I think you're a little older than me. You're graduate high school when like about 72 or so, 1972? Exactly, 72. Yeah, yeah. yeah so you're yeah. just finishing the Vietnam yeah. War kind of stuff. But so when you're growing up, there's a lot of racial strife going on, even in a little town like yours, I'm sure with, uh, you know, whites versus natives versus all that kind of stuff, I would assume. There was a little of that, but uh, Plentywood, which was the county seat, was far enough away from the reservation that the the Fort Peck Indian Indians that were on the reservation didn't really come up to Plentywood that much. It was pretty segregated. They stayed on the reservation, and you know, the only time we really saw them was during sports, mm. and they were great athletes. I was going to say they great beat you. Right? <laughs> they always beat us. Well, sometimes, sometimes, <laughs> but uh, you know, it's funny back there. The stock back there is. Um, you know, there's 35 boys in my senior class and 17 girls, and and the the stock back there only the hardy people make it. You know, our starting basketball team, our center was 6'11", and our forwards were 6'6", off guard was 6'4", and I was the point guard at 6'1", and we played teams that were as big as that on the Indian reservation. You know, it's just big people back there. I remember when I was growing up, even when I was 6'1", I'd get be in a crowd back there and I'd be the shortest guy in the, mm -hmm. in the crowd. And, you know, I'd get out to Oregon and it's, it, it was kind of reversed. So mm -hmm. it was a hearty crowd, maybe not so smart staying out there so long, but <laughs> tough uh, 40 below in the winter and 110 oh, yeah. in the summer. Oh my gosh. So, and so when you're growing tough, up tough in that life. area, were you collecting any Native American art or Native American beadwork or any of that kind of stuff? Or were you really more coins and baseball cards kind of thing? Probably more coins. And, you know, I, we, I didn't have any money in my, you know, how I got really interested in art was my dad had a couple of prints of Charlie Russell on in his hardware store. And they weren't very much, but he wouldn't, you know, let me, he wouldn't let me have them because he wanted to sell them. But that's kind of where I got hooked on, on art. Just, he would have some prints and he'd sell them. And, you know, calendars, hardware calendars would have uh, sporting art like Philip Argood, one who I ended up writing a book on, you know, the, the great, the greatest sporting artist. And um, so it kind of started collecting, just being, you know, collectors are collectors. And in different times of our life, we switched to different collecting. But uh, back then it was mainly baseball cards and coins. You still that have sort of them? thing that I could trade with my buddies. I do have the baseball card collection. Most of my friends, and I always share, my mother threw it away when I let, right. went to college. And for some reason, my mom didn't. And uh, so I still have them. And yeah. I don't know what I'm going to do with them, but uh -huh. it's fun to look at. I mean, I pull them out every couple of years and look at them. So I did the same thing. It's funny. I collected coins and comics. And, yeah, with comics too. Yeah, and Native yeah. American stuff. I did collect Native American stuff, but I still have all that stuff too. I kept it all, you know. Yeah. And uh, I, I think there's a gene there. I've often felt that people who are collectors have some kind of rack pack gene that they just have to collect, and it just never goes away. It starts young, and if you have that, I mean, I can look in your library behind you, and you have lots of nice books, and I know you yeah. collect art and. Uh, all that kind of thing. So you must have, you know, I don't know if you uh, agree with the gene component, but you must have. No, I, I totally agree because most of the people I know around here are not collectors and um, you know, they can come in our house and I've got a $75 Adirondack chair that someone just spray painted with an Indian head on it. And they could, I have some pretty nice pieces of art and they never comment on that, but they'll say, boy, that's a nice chair. You know, so most of the people in that I've ever come in tune with, you know, other than outside of our area of uh, art, are are not big collectors, and yeah. um, so I think it is genetic, and I don't know why, exactly. Yeah, it's just I, you know, it probably is primordial 
something that goes back to you know hunting and gathering and people that collected all the certain kind of things probably did well or something. I don't know. Yeah. It, it probably goes that far Good. back. Yeah. And so That's as good. you're a kid, when you're growing up, did you, what was your area of interest? Did you think you were going to go into medicine or did you have an idea or was it kind of fluid for you? Well, I had, I did a little, they, in first grade, they had us make a picture of what we wanted to be when we grew up. And my dad was laying rugs to make more money than just selling screwdrivers and bolts and shotguns. Right. So my drawing was when I grow up, I either want to be a doctor or a carpet layer. Huh? And uh, because the doctor was like, we had one doctor in town. And he was like the only really educated person in town. My, my dad never graduated from college. He did one year and then went to World War II. Most of, the, man, my, most of my dad's buddies uh, had a sixth grade education. It really, growing up where I grew up was like, really like growing up in the 30s or 40s. It wasn't the 60s. It was so isolated. I mean, we still had silver dollars, buffalo nickels. I mm. collect the Indian head pennies. They were all in circulation there. And I remember one time at my dad's hardware store, someone came from Seattle and said, hey, do you know, there's no silver dollars in most parts of the United States anymore. And we thought, wow, that's weird. Because <laughs> there were no credit cards. Everybody had silver dollars and, you know, standing Liberty quarters and 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 all these um, coins and and so that's kind of where I got my Indian fix with all the Indian pennies and of course the ultimate was the James Earl Fraser uh, Buffalo Head Nickel. Yeah, love that one. So uh -huh. I have a similar uh, kind of a story actually. When I was in like uh, middle school, I would go and all the ladies that would take the food for the lunch, you know, kids would bring f money from home, and often if they didn't have enough money, they I think they got into their parents' uh, coin collection or whatever. And I would, <laughs> every day after they took all the money in, I would go through and pick out all the old coins and get, then tra trade them for new coins. They didn't care. They didn't understand what I was doing, but it was still around. They were still in circulation. Oh, yeah. Them. And 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 what happened, um, I was laying carpet with one of my dad's employees, summer job. And you know, the United States started going off the uh, total 90% silver in 64, 65, 66. They started going, right. you know, 40% silver. But I told him, I said, hey, you know, in Canada, they st still have all the silver. So we went up to Regina, Saskatchewan, and got all the silver out of it. And then the, what was the Hunt brothers, uh, you know, had right. that push on the silver level that's never hit again. And I sold it all and helped pay for quite a bit of my education. It was great. <laughs> so you went up to Regina and you just traded out for, was, was there Canadian coins? This was all Canadian stuff? Yeah, there were Canadian silver. They're 50 cent pieces and quarters and they're they 90% silver. So they were like silver. And we just went to every bank in town and cleaned the whole and Regina's a big city. It's, you know, it was 150, 180,000 then. So uh -huh. we went to all the banks, came across, back across the border. Um, I don't know if we were supposed to say anything about the coins, no, but we didn't. totally illegal, I'm and, sure. Uh, <laughs> I didn't sure know. Was. I, was I, I, I was just, a, you know, in high school, so. Where'd you get the capital anyway, to go in and get the back. Where'd you go get the capital to get the, to buy the stuff? Well, it, you know, it did. I was uh, mowing lawns, um, you know, back, you know, out here in Oregon, the kids in the valley all pick strawberries and all that sort of stuff. We picked rock. You know, the the, the uh, wheat fields were so terrible with rocks that they'd pay kids to go out and, and uh, you know, pick rock and used to deliver the grit. I don't know if you remember that one. That was a, no. a weekly newspaper and, you know, it was a grit boy. Um, so it's kind of like the Saturday Evening Post and the Ladies Home Journal were, um, mm. you know, that wasn't mail delivery. Those were those were uh, post boys and they would get the Saturday Evening Post on Thursday and then deliver it on Saturday. So. And so you go into, uh, well, let me just ask you about your family. Did you have other brothers and sisters? I had two sisters, two older sisters. I see. And, so you were the youngest. And they were... Yeah, one was 10 years, Linda, and then Kathy was five. So they're quite a bit older than me. Mm -hmm. But I, so I hung out with the, the uh, plumber's kids. Three, he had three sons, and that's where I spent all my time. 
down there. And, and it was great because they would play basketball. They're all much older. So I'd be playing basketball when I was seven or eight against 12, 13, 14 year olds. And so it really helped me. Uh, by the time I was playing kids my own age, it was, it, was, it turned out well. <laughs> Before you blew out your knee, did you think maybe it, that's what I want to do? I want to be a basketball player? Well, I, I did, but I think I really had a passion to go to medical school early on. So I yeah. kind of, uh, uh, my daughter was a really good basketball player when she was mm -hmm. in high school. And I told her, this is fine. In fact, I coached their teams when a couple state AAU don't, I would just so you didn't chase that one, just, you know, go to med school. She did now she's a uh, faculty at Duke medical yeah. so um what did she get her i kind of uh, i kind of early on i thought I, what's that i was gonna say what did she get her degree in she's a physician she, what is she's in allergy and immunology which has oh, been wow. a real real nice during um this covid thing because we early on like in january we were receiving information from her that the public wasn't getting that this virus had probably been around in china since probably november at least mm -hmm. and uh so and and so a lot of the things we got we got some terrifying information out of italy before you know they released it to the public so um, i knew some thing bad things were going to happen so. Yeah, that's the problem, you know, but there's not really much you could do other than maybe no. an N95 mask. I mean, there's really not much you can do. Exactly. Yeah, we had heard exactly. the same thing from our uh, my uh, wife's sister, who was an infectious disease, you know, person. That stuff was coming down the road, but you you know you don't know what to do. And we haven't been through a real pandemic since 1918, so um, right. It's been a rather interesting situation and you're still practicing medicine too right no i actually uh, i bailed out a little later than you but i i stopped to like um 11 years ago so i've oh. been in central oregon I, I was in lake oswego which is a suburb of portland we've moved over here 11 years ago and that's allowed me to my dad actually, the reason I, I retired at age 56 was my dad died of a brain tumor at 56. And I'm uh, I, right when I was starting medical school and I said, well, if my, my, one of my life goals is to retire at 56, if I make it that long. And uh, so that was a huge factor in my life because we were very close. You and your father were very close. relationship with him and I was yeah. a great loss. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah really close. Yeah, that can affect you greatly to have those kind of things go on in your life. And when he died at, you're 18 and he, he died at that time, or you're not 18, you're in medical school, so you're about 22 or so, 23 probably. Right. Um, you know, yeah, how did that affect things for you when that happened? Well, it was kind of a blessing and, and uh, a curse because I was um, so busy, as you know, with medical school. I was actually taking a neuroanatomy at that time. And, uh, and it was, uh, it was tough because in that era, there wasn't a lot of compassion. I thought by the medical professors, they just, you know, okay, well, you know, get back to class. So, right. so I, I, you know, I had, I had that, uh, kind of, I didn't have a lot of time to sit around and think about it, but I think process. about it all the time. Yeah. So it's an ongoing in process thing. Yeah. Even now, right? Even now. Yeah. Yeah. I understand that. Yeah. 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 I spent a lot of time with my father like that too. So we had lunch together every day for like 20 years. So, yes. Yeah. Uh, and I miss that. Yeah. Yeah. That's tough. Well, when you, you never really know him as an adult to an adult when you, I left, I left Plentywood at 18. Um, and so there was not never a, an adult relationship. And so that you miss that mm. for sure. And so when you went to college, you went pre-med. That was your route at that time? Yeah, I went to Montana State for a year. Um, they had, if you're like at the top of your class, you, they actually paid for your tuition. Hmm. But, and so um, I got there and, and the first quarter, um, 
we, I, I went to a lot of parties and at Christmas, my dad had a little talk with me about it and <laughs> had a friend out at the University of Oregon. And that spring I took a tennis class at Montana State in Bozeman and I didn't get out there. It was like four feet of snow until June. And my friend out in Eugene said, hey, you can ride your bike all winter long here and everything, you know, it's beautiful here. The grass is green all winter. And so I transferred to the University of Oregon my sophomore year and went uh -huh. from Montana State where, where cowboys, you know, lassoing wood cows in the hallways to everybody laying around the University of Oregon looking like uh, Charlie Manson and smoking <laughs> pot. And uh -huh. It was a huge, huge uh, shock to me. Yeah, that's 73, yeah. right? Somewhere around that time, 74? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So the yeah. Vietnam War is just kind of rolling and down now at this point we're out of Vietnam. So you kind of missed all that, I guess, to some extent. Well, I got a draft number. I remember waiting at, for the Great Falls Tribune to arrive um, in Plentywood. You know, Great Falls was like 400 miles from Plentywood. Right. And I got, a, I got a high draft number. Plus, my knee was blown out, so I, I don't think they would have taken me. But, um, you know, we knew people in town that were older than me. I think there were some that were killed. Um, a couple of them went to West Point. The one mm. thing about my hometown was is they valued education. So in my little class of 50 people, um, several doctors, several dentists, accountants, chemical engineers, the plumbers kids I grew up with ended up being chemical engineers and civil engineers. I mean, it was, there was a, it was a great school system. So the Vietnam was centered around watching, you know, the nightly news and seeing all the horrible things, knowing some of the older kids that and when it ended up going over there and dying. And then there were a few of them that were draft dodgers. A couple of them, the farmer's kids went to Canada, a couple went to South America. Mm. And of course, for my conservative dad and his friends, that didn't go over too well. Yeah. So, I'm sure. <laughs> no. <laughs> and, you know, the, the, had you made your own decision what you would be doing? Had you thought about it? I guess you probably didn't have any choice. You were going. Well, go. yeah, I certainly didn't want to go. I mean, I don't think anybody did. And I know a lot of people went in the reserves. And, and I think there was that school, if you stayed in college, um, you got that deferral. Yeah. Which uh, probably wasn't real fair to the folks that couldn't afford to go to college or didn't have the aptitude to you know it probably was a very unfair thing to do yeah well it may have pushed some of those kids that were plumbers kids to go to school you know just in yeah. another concept that maybe they would have stayed in the business and done all that but if there was a yeah. lane to get out and to go and do something else so you could avoid that kind of stuff maybe some people did get educations that didn't i never really i think that's a good that. point yeah. yeah, I think that's a good point. Plus, when, you, when you're in Plentywood, you're waiting to get out of there. I mean, it wasn't like, man, I can't wait to stay here and retire. <laughs> it was it was a tough life. I mean, the yeah. people were wonderful, but uh, that the environment of weather was just horrendous. Yeah, and they're like mainly ranchers and farmers and that kind of thing, primarily. Yeah, mainly ranchers, mainly, you know, dry wheat farming and and cattle ranchers, yeah. some some sheep, but mainly cattle and, you know, Northern Plains, you know, some of those images like Charlie Russell painted. Yeah. Right I'm out sure. of there. I'm sure they were one of the reasons he resonates to you is because you could visualize and see and feel and think and, you know, that kind of environment, I'm assuming. Yeah, I, I think so. And, and, and obviously that's one thing that resonates with me with Maynard Dixon, you know, his arid scenes, desert scenes. Um, yeah. In fact, when I was uh, when I was early in my dermatology practice, I'd go to the American Academy of Dermatology they had every couple of years at the, in San Francisco. And so I traipsed down to 728 Montgomery Street. Yeah, very you know, good. And, and uh, That's really good. Huh? Yeah. And looking for where Maynard was. And, you know, I've got a the back I saw my, the home of the Blackfeet back behind yes, you. Yes, that's 1938. the back. <laughs> that's yeah, that's the back of my uh, call of the mountains, the Artists of Glacier Park that I did about 20 years ago. So mm -hmm. I'm not a, I'm not any uh, latecomer to Maynard because you, you and others have done such a good job of uh, keeping him 
where he should be. And I, as you know, I showed you in my new book coming out. Uh, I it was fun uh, doing this new book because I was able to look at 120 of the greatest artists from from Moran to Bierstadt to Remington to Russell to N. C. Wyeth and Pleisner and all the Kaus artists and of course yeah. Maynard. Maynard makes it in my searchers um, section. I think I sent you that article. It's did I read that? It was very Western good. art collector. Right yeah, up my uh, alley, quite uh, frankly, especially that time frame. Yeah, well, the the essays. There's seven essays in the book, and that that article I sent you is probably one tenth of one percent of the essays, which examines every uh, area of Western American art. And I learned a lot. I love doing books where I don't know anything. Yeah, um, and and I just love it. I, I mean, I I learn so much uh, about everybody, and you know, I and the art styles and the schools and the and uh, so it was a it was a great experience, and fortunately the books, uh, you know, just going I went to the printer last week, and you know once you send these books to the printer, I don't know how you are, but I feel like the stupidest person in the world because the indexer and the proofreaders find all these mistakes you make in spelling and stuff. Right. And right. It just it's just like I can't believe I looked at this twelve times before I sent it to the publisher, and the stuff I I miss it's just I can't believe it. It's well, very humbling. Yeah. Well, the reason you miss it is because now I've done like, I don't know, 11 books. And, uh, I, I, you know, I miss them too. I, and what it is, is you read it over and over and over and your brain just doesn't see it because you've read it the same way over and over and over again. And you just can't see it. You visually cannot see it. Um, that's why I give it to a dozen people to go through and find things. Yeah. And I'm always amazed, massive things that they find. And I know. Uh, yeah, it's just, yeah, you just need good people to read it. You, know, you have the editors and great, but I send it to lots of different people just to, so they can find those little things that you go, ah. or sometimes they're just things that I don't, wouldn't ever realize, you know, I called, you know, a big hunk, you know, a kind of taffy and it wasn't, it was a sugar. And it's like, you know, somebody says, well, it's not that. So, you know, we can only do what we can do, right. As, as writers. And uh, well, I get by with a little help from my friends, you know, Ringo. Yeah, <laughs> definitely, uh, definitely need that. That's for sure. It's it's for me, it's very humbling when I get done with these books, the, the low point of the whole thing, there's a high point that you're done with it. But the low point is, is it takes me a while to get over, you know, when you're OCD, like you and I are, and I make these errors, it really gets to me, but yeah. I, it passes. It gets to on. me less. <laughs> yeah. Think. And part of it, I think, maybe because I write a lot of nonfiction. You mainly, I mean, fiction, and you write nonfiction. And so, right. you, can, you know, it, it's, there's just more latitude, so much more latitude. When I wrote the big biography on Dixon, my God, you know, it was like, I was very pleased when it was done. And I found myself, you know, you say you, you like to, to uh, do a topic you don't know about because you learn so much. I found even writing on Dixon, I'd go down these rabbit holes and I had no oh, idea. Yeah. And, you know, it'd be like, I'm, I'm thinking I'm almost done with that chapter. And it's like, oh my God, I just found another month's worth of work. Oh my goodness, how am I, I going to finish it? And so for you, it must be, you're going down rabbit holes constantly. It is, in, you know, and I've had somewhat of that experience like you because I've done, I don't know, three books on Russell. And yeah. um, I want to and, get into it too, actually. And, yeah, and, and you know, every time I go uh, into a new book, even on Russell, there are so many things I learn from people. You know, um, so it's it's fun though. It it I just love uh, learning from other people. I I not one of these people that I like to listen. So this talking like us, this is something I don't do with anybody. I I've been on different boards and associations where when we get done after being on it for two years, they don't even know I was a doctor, wrote a book because I don't really like talking about myself. <laughs> so this is probably the most um, I've talked about myself, perhaps in my lifetime, to tell you the truth. <laughs> I never talk, I never liked it. I just don't talk about it. Most people in this area don't know I have an art collection or do books, so. Yeah, and that's exactly why I want to talk to you because yeah. We want to know the backstory, and uh, you have a very interesting backstory. And I actually want to 
follow that whole thread through. And in fact, let's go back to where you're in medical school now. And at that point, were you just tunnel vision? This is what I'm gonna do. And the art part really hadn't kicked in as far as the history and writing and that stuff. You were really focused on research and that type of thing at that point. Yeah, and I don't know if you had the experience, but I, I tell you, when I got out of medical school, I had the feeling like if I have to read another book, it'll be too soon. I, I, it took me several years, and I got, then I got into, um, I, I, and I kept doing, actually, I had a research lab after I got out of my, my residency, a melanoma research lab, um, mm. for a few years, but I also had a private practice. And I, I think it started with, um, I just, you know, I'm in dermatology, so it's a visual uh, science, which yep. go, just goes right into art. I mean, yep, awesome. I have to be, I have, I spend all day, um, when you really get good at it, you know, you're referred something from a regular doctor and they've seen them 12 times for the problem. And I can walk in the door and tell them from six feet, you know, what they have. And so it's, it's a quick visual detection, you know, looking at people's skin for, you know, bad things on it. Um, so it was, it's a real, I've always been visual, so it, it really works well with the Western art. And I started talking to people and um, early on started going to the Russell auction in Great Falls every year. That was the great auction in America back then. All the great art dealers, um, you know, went there from Rudy Wonderlich to, you know, all the Bob Drummond, you know, mm -hmm. Stu Johnson, who I'm sure you know, and, and, uh, um, Peter Stremmel and, and Bill Burford, Texas Art Gallery, and, mm -hmm. you know, just on and on, Brad Richardson and Michael Frost, great guys, um, you know, just all these people, and man, I was in, it's like in a candy store, and, you know, they'd have it the, at the Heritage Inn during that auction week, all the great art dealers would, would take a room and then put up all the great art, so you'd see, you know, tons of the greatest art, and, and you probably know from that era, um, before all these Western art, art, art auctions took, took hold, most of the great art was sold in New York at Christie's and Sotheby's. You'd get the catalog, there was no right. internet, and all the dealers would go several times a year, you know, for Western American Art Week and at Christie's or Sotheby's. And then, you know, we now know that there's Western art auctions almost in every place in the West. So it's really expanded, but I, I got my start, you know, going to the Russell auction. And were you uh, already out of your residency and all that time when you started that, when you started going to the Russell? Uh, yes, yeah, so I was out of my residency. And so I was in private practice and, and again, was in a position where I wasn't, I was seeing patients and loving my patients, but I wasn't learning and researching as much as I was doing a little melanoma research, but then the art thing took off. and. Um, did Charles M. Russell legacy that came out and I donated all the proceeds to the Russell Museum and we sold a ton of those. That was in 99. Was fortunate enough to win the Western Heritage Award. So that got me geared up, you know, going down there and seeing all the movie stars and that were still living back then. And mm -hmm. Maureen O'Hara for the and then I that, a year or so later, Maureen O'Hara was the MC, you know, and she sat talk about John Wayne got that one for the Philip R. Goodwin book, the sporting art book. And, and so I figured, well, I'm having some success doing this and people seem to like the books and then did one on LA Huffman photographer and that thing sold close to the, and I didn't know how to do, but you know, these books were a hundred dollars a piece back then. And uh, you know, it's, it's the sales on all the different editions that, you know, topped almost a million bucks. Yeah. And uh, wow. so, and as you know, um, what's changed is, is you can't charge as much today for an art book as you could 20, 25 years ago, which I know you've explored and examined with art, <laughs> art dealers and museum people about, you know, yeah. where, uh, where it's all going. But you, the, the whole book thing, like a lot of areas, it's just, you can't charge, um, I mean, the book, this American West Reimagine that's coming out has 500 and 560 uh, illustrations, 12 by 12 format, you know, 528 pages, huge index. 
yeah. pretty much everything you'd want to know about Western American art, and it's going to come out for 85 bucks, you know, less than oh it my took. God, to, how do they even Yeah, do that? less yeah. than it took to, uh, you know, the uh, fortunate enough, the Coeur d'Alene Art Auction boys, um, I got like their greatest hits, you know, and they for a long time had the uh, auction records on almost every artist. So we have everything in there. It's, I mean, it's, people are going to be stunned when they see this book. How yeah, what's it called? Is. What's the, the actual title of the book? It's called The American West Reimagined Gems from the Coeur d'Alene Art Auction. Hmm. And, and the real, as you know, the real sweet spot for Western American art auctions was before the 2008 blow in the market. Right. Tons of stuff came up from around late 90s to 2008. And it was also the time when a lot of um, oil guys and other really wealthy people had the money to really go after it you know and and the big auction was the Coeur d'Alene art auction and then you know we've got a lot of other great auctions now too that compete with them but they went through art uh, well your Maynard you know Dixon storytellers one that's still the highest at auction and that's that starts my searchers chapter I picked Maynard <laughs> to start you know above Remington above Remington and Schreibogel and Frank yep. Penny Johnson and and uh, Lee and you know all these guys, so I'm I'm a big Dixon fan. And and so on this book, do you talk about price structure or any of that kind of uh, component with the book, or is it strictly here's the artist, this is who they were, this is what they did? Yeah, we we talked about that, and and other that's about the only thing I've talked with the Coeur d'Alene Art Auction. Other other than that, they just said do it. They've had no input. They didn't say, well, what are you writing, or you be sure. They've given me full freedom to do this book. And so it's really an academic book. You know, each part has a, a long opening essay on what was happening to those artists and then their artist profiles. So there's 120 artist profiles in the book, basically many biographies, which I went through. And of course, if I could turn around this thing, I have hundreds of art books in here. And um, so I've got pretty much every art book that's ever come out for the last 30 years and uh, plus the internet stuff. And, and so it was a lot of fun constructing uh, biographies on a lot of different people in a lot of different, you know, from the romantic landscape artists to, uh, you know, uh, Norman Rockwell, you know, yeah. um, NC Wyatt. Uh, how many of those were women that were in this or in the book? How many are women? You know, there's a few. Um, but I kind of address that, you know, there, you know, early in, on there weren't, and the ones I focus on, everybody in the book is, you know, was dead before the 20th century, except for um, um, Howard Turtening. Howard um, and Stuart had, as you know, a good relationship. So right. we're, we're doing, a, I'm doing a part on Howard in, in every one of his 20 paintings and they're a full page. And, uh, but there were some, some women, um, but not a lot. Um, I just think it was, um, you know, the times. There weren't as many great women artists out there. Um, yeah, especially doing that. Grace kind of Hudson, thing. yeah. Rosa, you know, Rosa Bonnier, or however you say her name. She's got the, yeah, that's right. the, 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 the bison one that came up a year or two ago at Coeur d'Alene that went for 800,000. She's a yeah. fascinating person. I have one and of so what it's my wall actually do yeah my collection yeah yeah yeah. Do. yeah she's she i have a really nice uh profile of her and and uh catherine layton that probably yes. a lot of people would know about she's in la but she went up to glacier park did a lot of the indians in montana mm -hmm. um and new mexico too she also and, painted it yeah mexico. i think mary cassatt um had mm -hmm. one of hers and there are a couple of hers just yeah. because there's a little mixing. They, every once in a while, they would get um, at the Coeur d'Alene Art Auction a uh, French artist or um, you know, some Impressionist stuff. And I kind of threw it in there because you know, those guys, especially someone like Maynard Dixon, they, they had a huge effect. And, and uh, you know, a, a ton of artists went to uh, Munich and Dusseldorf and Paris and Rome sure. to be trained. I mean, right. you know, tons of them. And, and so, um, and I profile all the different art schools. I mean, it's, you know, the um, Art Students League, Salma Gundy Club, you know, you've had, you've talked a lot about that. Maynard was a member there. Yeah. And, uh, and so it's uh, Philip R. Goodwin, one of my supporting yeah. art, art heroes. 
and uh, you know the National Academy of Design, which was huge, and um, you know the Biltmore Salon, you know yep. Frank Tenney Johnson and Clyde Forsyth, Victor Clyde Forsyth started that, and so it it it, it it's a lot of information. I want to put information in this book that you don't a lot of times see in a lot of other books. I mean, kind of giving the full. Uh, rounds of, well, the Art Institute of Chicago and Philadelphia Institute of Fine Arts. I mean, those all played incredibly important parts in the, in the development of a lot of uh, artists. You know, they weren't like Maynard, who, you know, who was what, born in Fresno, and he had to go east to find the west, of course. That's true. And, uh, and, and so most had stayed in the east and came out west for a little while and then went back and they took artifacts and they took a heck of a lot of photographs that they never liked to talk about but photography was huge um, in uh, them being especially Remington being able to capture their reimagine their idea of the west so well you, in did, the a title, on, you did a whole book on Russell on photos right on his photos that he's yeah doing. photographing the yeah. legend right there I don't know if you, so if you, you see it yeah I guess the people who are listening to this go to the YouTube part, and you can put it in. In fact, there, if you have um, some images of Russell you can share, we'll put them on the YouTube version too, so they can actually see some of those. Yeah, because he he got his camera in what, like the 1880s, right? He was, or 1890s, something yeah. really. Yeah, but most of these are, yeah. most of these images are ones they took of him. Nancy. You know, would, it, right. Nancy did, uh, Dorothea Lang, you know, Charlie was in uh, uh, Maynard Dixon's, uh, studio in san francisco in 1924 in january 1924 he was going to la because they had a place in pasadena and he stopped at maynard dixon's um, studio and dorothea lang took several shots of his face with a cigarette in his hands mm -hmm. and they're in the book and and then he you know dixon i think had his uh, exhibition there at the Biltmore a, a month later, and then Charlie had his uh, unveiled the Bucker and the Buckaroo Bronze there um, shortly thereafter. But so, I mean, a lot of famous photographers. Um, Edward Curtis took uh, Russell's photo at, at the Biltmore um, and uh, did gold tone, a couple gold tones. I have actually a photograph Curtis did of Russell that's signed by Curtis and, and Russell. Wow, which I think is, I, I think that's one of a kind. So one of a um, one of a kind. Yeah, that's that sounds like yeah. going to a museum at some point. It probably will because uh, I, I do a lot of stuff with the Russell Museum and the Montana Historical Society. So. Yeah, you're actively involved with the Russell Museum, right? I know that for sure. Yeah, I'm going to actually be the chair of the board of directors in March. Yeah. I've been on the, and I actually it's kind of funny. I got into it, you know, 20, 25 years ago. And I was the chairman of the National Advisory Board at the Russell Museum. And I had all these guys that were 25 years older than me, multimillionaires, all art collectors. And, uh, you know, and, and they were all so much older than me, um, but got, became all great friends with them. And, you know, almost all of them are dead now. Mm. And, and so it's, and then it's evolved into uh, being the chair now of uh, the board and, I do a lot of stuff with the Montana Historical Society. You know, that American Trinity book I sent you, all the proceeds right. went to the um, Historical Society to bring uh, Indian children to, the, to Helena to see their collection. Yeah, I and, saw that. Uh, I thought that was fantastic that you did that. I really, I'm just, my hats are off to you for that, to give all your book, not just a little bit, all your proceeds to have American Indian children to be able to go do things like that is amazing. Congratulations on that, quite frankly. Well, I, I think we all need to try to do our part and I, it's pretty minor, but you know, you feel yeah, like- I don't know about that. As an author to give all your, the, the entire royalties, everything that comes out at sales, that's a pr pretty big deal. Well, feel comfortable and happy I can do it. <laughs> uh -huh. And I wanna ask you when, you, when did you begin writing? At what point, how old were you and why? Because you're a physician, you're busy as hell. I know what a dermatologist takes to be a dermatologist. And I agree with you, by the way. I fully believe that radiologists and dermatologists make the best art collectors, art dealers, art uh, you know, uh, critics, because they do look for color, lights, just 
little shades of change. Yeah, your brain's just trained that way. Yeah. You know, it, it, I, I, I think that is very true, I would say. And, and I think I pick up a lot of things in art that a lot of people probably don't, you know, and, and I, may, I don't know what that means, but yeah. I don't know if how important that is. But I just, I think I look at art a little differently than everybody else. Um, I think it's but, very important, actually. I, you, I actually almost went into dermatology interestingly enough, I was in the Navy physician and I looked at the residency and went out to Bethesda and all that. And I worked in a derm clinic for six months just because I liked it so much. Yeah. I had no idea this was related to art at all at this time, but I just loved, you know, the thought of being able to see different patterns and shapes and things. And I was always very interested in like radiology, which is the same thing. So it makes clear sense to me that you would be very good at at art, it just totally makes sense. But what point was it as when you're practicing and you're so busy um, that you go, okay, I want to be a writer of, of history? I think it started with, again, going to one of the Russell auctions and a uh, fellow I befriended was into memorabilia like Charlie Russell's cigar boxes and calendars and, and postcards, you know, there's Russell, all that sort of ephemera, um, which I ended up writing Charles M. Russell Legacy, and uh, which did real well, and uh, sold out like in two months, like five or 10,000 copies at $100 a piece. But wow. I, I um, and he was so endearing and loves Russell so much that he, his name's Jim Combs, and he's still a dear friend of mine. And he really opening up his collection, he had a collection um, that was like no other in the country. And, and so I actually, in, in those days, I did like the legacy book. It's a big 12 by 12 format, four or 500 pages, 1200 images in it. And I photographed the whole thing myself. I went around to his thing. Um, a lot of the images for legacy were, were photographed on his wife's friend's uh, ironing board in, yeah. in their house. I right. went around the country, I had my little tripod, knew nothing about um, macro lenses. I had learned photography, so I did. And I had a little, those days you could take a bunch of stuff on the plane, so I'd have two lights, um, <laughs> I had to figure out what kind of film to use. And so, so the, the legacy was totally, as was the L.A. Huffman. The L.A. Huffman has like 600 images in it, and I photographed that whole book like in a morning at Gene Allen's house, Gene and Bev Allen's house in Helena. That's when it almost sold a million dollars worth of books. But that's, I got my start in, you know, 97, 96. I was right around when I was the, the chairman of the National Advisory Board at the Russell Museum. And when I get into things, I get into them pretty good. So that's, that's how it started and, and the success of them. They sold well. It's not like I had all, and I paid for all the books and then donated all it to the Russell Museum. And and it wasn't like, oh, well, these books are sitting around on the, you know, are they going to, or are we going to have to mark them down to $5 a piece? Uh -huh. And and so that was motivating. I mean, you don't want to spend that much, to, you know how much time it is doing a big book and then yeah. they don't sell. You know, yeah. it, it kind of goes, okay, well, maybe I'll go back to baseball card collecting or something. <laughs> but it, it worked out. But there had to be something more than that. Was there this you know, epiphany? The was there. Yeah, was there an epiphany moment though when you go, I can do this, I can write books on history, I love history, I love art, um, I can do this? It was it or was it just a gradual thing? You started, you know, writing and then you said, Yeah, maybe I should try this. I think it was probably the show where Jim Combs had all his stuff and his cigar boxes and everything. And it just so man, this stuff needs to be in a book because no one there's no book out there on all this and that people need to know all the, how loved Russell was. And, uh, you know, you can look at all the artists and we can critique their art, but there was no one as loved as Russell. I mean, yeah, that's true. I think that's everybody true. loved him and he loved everybody else and he never forgot his old cowboy friends. And so, yeah, I know for Dixon. And, uh, a lot of the other artists. Yeah, I know for Dixon that he really um, admired Russell on, on, a lot of, on a lot of levels. And I think a lot of it was that he came out, he really lived the cowboy life. He knew 
you know, the, the, Na the Native Americans, he understood it. And what Dixon really wanted to do when he came and visited him in 1917 is he wanted to learn from him about costumes because he felt like Russell really understood costumes and, how, and the correct things and how you do it. And Dixon was a stickler for that. So, you know, that was one of the reasons he came out to spend time with him was for that just very reason. Yeah, he had a pretty good uh, studio collection of, and and he was very authentic with. Uh, but you know, right. he lived the cowboy life there out on the plains for a number of years as a nighthawk who stayed up all night with the horses. He wasn't much of a cowboy, but he was around great cowboys. Teddy Blue Abbott, you know, that's the basis of Lonesome Dove, Teddy Blue Abbott's life, and um, you know, Gus and uh, Lonesome Dove dies in Miles City, just south of Plentywood. So, got mm -hmm. that connection. But um, yeah, it, I, I think Dixon, um, when I look at Dixon, what I love about him and what I think of is, you know, to, for an artist uh, to fall in love with the mountains, all you have to do is open your eyes. But to fall in love with the desert, the soul has to fall in love with it, not just your eyes. I think Dixon had a, a deep, feeling and understanding of the landscape, you know, in the, the Western, like John Ford, they all say the main character in a Western uh, is the landscape. And, and I think, I think Dixon knew that and, and did it better than anybody else. Good. I'm going to quote but you. It was that. his soul. He, he <laughs> saw the desert and uh, he opened his soul. And so when did you actually. Well, it's a big difference. I mean, it's easy to fall in love with the mountains. But yeah, and it's interesting. It's, it's, he didn't shout more challenging. Yeah, Dixon never could wrap his head around the mountains very well. You know, he really, uh, I think it just it clogged his horizon, and he had a hard time being in trees. So he could do fantastic things, um, but there's no doubt that he liked the open plains and those open vistas and the desert and the bareness and the solitude and the loneliness and all those things that I think come with you know a desert environment. And that's basically where I grew up. It was called the Great Desert. Um, and, and one other thing I think about Dixon that maybe a lot of people don't understand if you didn't grow up in a place like I grew up, it's the sky and the clouds. The desert allows you to look up and, and fall in love with the skies. So while you may look down and it's pretty barren sometimes a year, you can look up at that big sky in Montana where the clouds go as far as you can see in the horizon, those billowy, and they look like they're gonna come down and kiss you on top of the head. And, mm -hmm. and I think Dixon in so many of his paintings, um, you know, the problem with the mountains is there aren't, there aren't skies. You know, you might right. have some mists or, or clouds in there, but the plains open up your ability, your soul to fall in love, not only with the landscape, but the sky also. Yeah, you're right on. I agree with that 100% what you just said. And so, when you started writing, how long till you decided I'm going to quit doing medicine? Because that's also a big thing. You were 56 when you quit, right? That's when your father passed away. He was yeah. Well, I, that was my goal be, because my dad had died at 56. So yeah. I, I, you know, I hung in there. I, I, and I enjoyed what I was doing. Enjoyed patients. Didn't enjoy all the insurance problems right. and capitation and and all right. the other stuff. Uh, it, you know, you can talk to any doctor, and they say all I do is spend time. Uh, filling out forms and and for a little boy from eastern montana kind of a rugged individualist having uh comp insurance companies tell us you know fill out these nine forms uh -huh. before you you know by the time you get done it's like you pay the patient not to come in because it costs you more to uh -huh. you know from your bookkeeper I, I think when i finished my bookkeeper said we were billing 500 different insurance addresses and each one of them wanted something else so anyway so when you quit, I was, you're, 50, you're 56, and you start whole hog right into writing? Yeah, we moved over here, and, you know, we have 160 acres, got a small lake and pasture, and I do all the, all the work. I'm the ranch hand, which is yeah. good. It keeps me physically fit. Um, I, I just don't sit up in a, in a desk in a dark room. And, mm -hmm. um, but it, so it's a nice balance. But... You know, it, I, and I only do books where I, I kind of have those aha moments. I did one on 
that I don't, you probably haven't seen on John Clark a, a year ago. It's a big book. No, I did. I looked it and, up actually. I'm very interesting. Oh, did you? I looked up his yeah. sculpture. Yeah. He, he was yeah. deaf, mute. And uh, yeah, no, I, I did, in fact. Yeah. And why did you pick that subject matter? Because he's a, you know, well, he's kind a, of obscure guy, really. Yeah. He, um, he had uh, been in my book, The Call of the Mountains, 20 years earlier, the one back here that Maynard's in. So mm -hmm. I always admired him. And, and his, his sculptures, would, wood sculptures, would show up at um, auctions around Montana. Most of my friends had his pieces. And right. the Montana Historical Society and the Russell Museum have very important pieces. And, you know, Rock of, Rockefellers uh, collected his pieces and some very famous uh, President Harding had one of his pieces. And, and so he, at the time, was the most, most famous woodcarver in the country and mm. was promoted by a bunch of people. And, and it was a dramatic story because he was deaf and went to deaf schools. And his grandfather was Malcolm Clark, who was, who was um, murdered by some of his relatives and uh, ended up causing the Baker, famous Baker Massacre, they, mm. where they went in and, and soldiers were looking for the guy that killed, the people that killed uh, uh, Malcolm Clark and they ended up going into a village of innocent old men and women and children that were dying of smallpox and they cleaned them out, they killed everybody. It's mm. kind of it's kind of like, you know, the other Washita or Sand Creek, Wounded Knee. They just went in and killed him. The, the guy, the general, that you know, they told him it was the wrong village and he was drunk and they went in there and it's so and and Malcolm Clark um, John Clark's grandfather was one of before he was murdered was one of the founders of the Montana Historical Society so he was a big name in Montana and mm -hmm. and Charlie Russell and John Clark were friends every time Charlie would go up to Glacier he'd stop at East Glacier where Clark had his gallery um, and go in with Joe DeYoung, you know, and Joe was deaf and, Ch right. and Charlie. And so Charlie and John Clark and, and Joe DeYoung would do sign language to each other, you know, and so that was fun for all of them. Sharp was deaf too. Did you know that? Joseph Sharp? Yes. Yeah. The beat of the drum. All he wanted to hear was the beat of the drum. And uh, uh -huh. he fell into the Ohio River. They pulled yeah. him out and yeah, brought right. him back, but he was... Yeah, and he, and he always said, you know, when he was out painting, people would, he could talk, you know, there's a whole thing on whether you want to use sign language or you make the deaf kids talk, and I talk about that in the Clark book, but uh, Sharp would say, hey, we need, when it was getting dark, he said, we need to go in because I can't talk anymore, because he would write stuff down on a piece of paper and people couldn't read it, so, hmm. yeah, and, and I'm sure that, that affected his, um, obviously his art and how fabulous he became sure yeah i mean i've never really thought about it in those terms but you know if you're deaf your other senses have to make up for a lot of that and you know art seems like it would be a natural uh, component of that there's another famous uh wood carver i don't know if you know him or not i actually collect his work his name is he's a cherokee indian willard stone have you ever heard of Willard? He's an Oklahoma. You know, I have heard of him, but I don't know anything about him. Yeah, you would you would find him very interesting just because you did the yeah. Clark book, and uh, I haven't read your book, but I read a, er, an excerpt of it, and I do want to go read that book. Um, and I looked at all his auction records and looked at what he did, and it was yeah, he's very good, very talented. Did that change his market somewhat when your book came out? Do you know? Oh yeah, I would think so. Uh, oh yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it did. It it the best analogy of, of went from selling five to ten thousand to three hundred thousand after the book came out, and and wow. so these books can move the market, and and that's really you know a lot of ways it moves the Dixon market, you know, sure, of course. with the shows, and 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 that has been the case for Remington and Russell and all of them. You know, if you have a the first thing that most art collectors do is they collect they do a scattershot approach they collect art most a lot of it's bad they don't know what they're doing and the really good ones spend their life getting rid of the bad art and then they start reading books on the artists that they love and and so the books play an important part in the whole 
art collecting. If there aren't any art books, you're not going to sell a lot of, you know, <laughs> people want to connect with these artists and understand them. I mean, it's part of the hobby. And, and so someone, you know, like your fabulous book on Dixon and, and that exhibit at, in Scottsdale, I mean, you know, you got it. It's great stuff. If you love an artist, you got to do it. You got the, yeah. the, you know, sort of abilities you have. So, you know, you're one of my, I'm a hero worshiper and you're one of my heroes. <laughs> Well, I told my <laughs> wife, I go, you should see this guy's resume. He puts me to shame. It's amazing. I love that. <laughs> well, I remember you wrote that, but I don't think so. <laughs> no, that's very true. When I read the Curtis book um, that was recently came out, Short Nights of the Shadow Catcher, yeah, I came away with it and said, I haven't done anything in my career. When you think about somebody like Curtis, who just spent 30 years every day, you know, 18 hours a day, if he could, you know, focusing on, uh, you know, what he thought was his vision and had to be done. And I get that same sense from you on the number of books you've written. How many books have you written, including a, uh, a fiction book as well? Half. Yeah. It was, Halfway to midnight. Halfway I, to midnight. I like it. See, one of my big things is it's attention to detail. You know, I, yeah. and, and uh, you know, you have attention to detail. I, I looked up the 728 uh you know <laughs> address <laughs> because because uh, i knew it and i'd been down there but i go what was the i knew it was on montgomery and kind of close to gumps <laughs> yes and uh but um yeah it it uh i don't i don't know i you know a bunch of them have been uh, uh reprinted but i think it's i don't know 13 or 14 interesting just a quickie on halfway to midnight which i have behind me um, yeah. I did that in 2010 for my class reunion. And the story is a pandemic in 2020. <laughs> my God. I, I read I, part of the book, by the way. I, I downloaded oh, yeah. it. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's yeah. kind of a goofy thing. But I, I wanted, and I put all my classmates in there because we had a class reunion. Plentywood, turned, my hometown turned 100 years old. Plus it was a class reunion year. So all my, you know, I had a book signing and all my buddies loved it, but it was about a pandemic in 2020 that I wrote in 2010. I got it wrong. It was on atypical tuberculosis um, uh -huh. or, and bacterial resistant tuberculosis instead of the virus. But anyway. you should, you should put that out again so people can read it during <laughs> the time. You know, yeah. it's, uh, well, I think it, they probably read enough about it. Pandemics. Uh, I actually started a book two years ago, which I didn't, I, you know, I didn't finish. And the title was Pandemic, and it was about, it was a fiction book. So uh, <laughs> timing is everything. That's pretty amazing. You picked it for 220 that you did that. Well, I have to read the whole book now. I'll download it from Amazon. I read the first one. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it, um, yeah there were, and it, the halfway to midnight was um, high noon equivalent right. from Gary Cooper, who was from Montana. So halfway to midnight's high noon. And it, yep. since there's no Gary Cooper to come in and help. So there mm -hmm. was a doctor and, uh, you know, in Plentywood. That, there's an uh, interesting I don't think book. I used Plentywood, but. There's an interesting book about that on the, the, the uh, Gary Cooper movie that they deconstruct the whole, uh, the whole uh, movie that you might find interesting. I can't remember the name of it, but it's. It's my favorite book. movie. Yeah, there's a whole book that was just recently done on that. And they talk about how it happened and how Gary got it and everything in the entire movie. So I'll see if I can find you the thing and I'll get it to you. So you've done how many books was it that you've done now? 14 books? I don't know. I think of maybe 12 um, with a bunch of reprints, maybe 16 or 18 or something like that. Yeah. And that's something a like that. short period of time, really. You started writing. 20 you know, years. Yeah, yeah, that's that's a years. lot. That's a lot of books, um, and part of that time when you were writing, you were still a physician, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it was a busy time. I I was a physician seeing, I don't know, forty, fifty people a day. I started seven thirty in the morning, and then I coached my girls, my daughter's basketball teams for years. You know, seventy five games a year, and also then wrote. Uh, the Charles and Russell legacy and the LA Huffman book and call of the mountains and you, you know, on and on. So I understand that. I, I don't, That's I don't have, have that energy have. anymore. Well, you, it's not only energy too, but it's passion. You have to have the passion to do that. Um, and so you've just finished this new book. 
um, that'll be coming out. When will that come? Let's plug that book a little bit too, because I want to. It'll be coming out in the spring, and uh, you know, it's it's going to be as high a quality a art book as you'd ever want to see. The papers from Northern Italy, hmm. Garda, Garda Matt, and the guy told me that I, I don't know much about the paper, but the, he says the paper is even coated with a, a fine. Um, stone from the same quarry where Michelangelo got the stone for David in northern wow. Italy. And and so every page is, you know, got a remnant of Michelangelo on it. So it it's 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 gonna it's a stunning book. And uh I think folks will really find uh um find it interesting. And and again I tried to really contextualize the times in, in which the artist lived. And, and factors. One of the things I like to do in my books is use context. Um, I read a lot of books where, you know, the artist went from A to B and he did this and that. And, you know, well, what about the Panic of 1893 or, right. you know, or, or the Depression years or, you know, all the different things, you know, the importance of the World's Fair, you know, in Chicago right. and, and San Francisco, you know, in 1915, where Maynard had, what, three of his paintings and won a bronze medal yep. or something. And, that's right. And and so all, you know, I love to contextualize things. And then also, I think the importance of this book is bringing out what energized the artist. And, and you know, during the 19th century, the 1800s, it was Manifest Destiny. You right. know, Christians were believed that God wanted them to have the land, the land in the West. And, and then that was supplemented later by... Darwinism when Darwin came out with his big book in 1859 and the whole social Darwinism thing. I mean Darwin was loved by Theodore Roosevelt you know a lot of you know a lot of these artists and and then the effect of Buffalo Bill Cody huge on artists in the United States and Europe I mean you can't underemphasize the effect that Buffalo Bill Cody had on western artists and then that melds into Western artists and, and Western books having an effect on the Holly, early Hollywood movies. And then the movies then had an effect on artists that, that watched the movies. So it's like art begot the films, the films begot the art. And, and so it, it kind of completed the, the circle. Yeah, that's right. I mean, the context of with these artists are painting is, is, is very important. As you said, with Buffalo Bill, I mean, you know, he has 5 million people go visit him in yeah. 1983. I mean, he's the most famous person in the world. So, you know, that and has he goes a, out and yeah. get, goes out and blows it in Cody and yeah, he did. lines around Tucson and he little oil fields in butt, Oklahoma. Uh, and and yep. by the time the early teens, he's bankrupt and sells his uh, show to a guy in Denver. And yep, that's and, right. You know, as, as Paul so nicely talks about, you know, fascinating guy. I mean, I get into another thing that people don't realize is how many of these artists were Europeans. And imagine it's almost like being deaf. You come to America and you don't understand English. But all of them were in, you know, enthralled with Buffalo Bill Cody because he, he went around Europe. There were these little periodicals that came out. him. so all of these European artists that ended up coming to the United States and becoming a lot of them great Western artists, they were all affected by Cody. Huge. Yeah. Well, even Dixon. I mean, Dixon met him and spent time with him and, you know, and even did a drawing of him. And I'm sure that I don't know Russell's uh, and uh, Wild Bill's uh, connection, but there must have been a significant one there too, I assume. Yeah, there were, there was some, um, you know, he, he admired him, you know, and it wasn't, I think uh, on their advertising posters, I think Remington and Schreivogel, especially Schreivogel was, you know, um, helped illustrate some of the posters. You know, it, it, as you know, they didn't just show up in towns. It was like, you know, the, the, the Christian revivals earlier, they sent out people ahead of time to rouse up the crowd and the community right. with advertising and stuff. And so by the time the show got there, they were primed. Yeah, you know, uh -huh. so it was a whole yeah. marketing deal. They didn't have TikTok to look at and waste their time. On. No, no, whatever. Yeah, I know what it is, but I haven't looked yeah. at it. Good, don't. But. It's addicting, and you shouldn't. <laughs> I avoid. 
So when your book comes out, how will people be able to get this latest book? Because it's what, five, over 500 pages, right? 500 Yeah, for $85. It's, you know, yeah, 25 years ago, it would have been a $250 book. So it's a great buy. Um, I'm not sure yet when they'll, at the Coeur d'Alene, it'll be available from, you know, the Coeur d'Alene Art Auction initially. I'm going to probably do a book signing, maybe a talk at their auction in the summer, maybe at the Russell Auction in August. And um, it'll eventually be on Amazon and, and, in our, and, and museums and things. I don't know how they want to release it yet. Yeah. In fact, I got to talk to them about that. Um, they've really given, I mean, they really just said, you know, do this book. And, um, and one person I should mention in the whole thing that I, I feel bad that I haven't is Bob Drummond. I think I mentioned his name, but he started, the, was one of the main guys at Coeur d'Alene Art Auction. And I think he's really the, father of the Western American art auction. He, he was a Rungus specialist and sporting mm -hmm. art specialist. He and I talked, um, you know, he and I were early risers. So when I was practicing dermatology, we'd get on the phone at 630 in the morning. And he taught me so much about art collecting. Fabulous mm -hmm. guy, um, you know, put the Coeur d'Alene art auction to a great extent where it is. And magnetic personality, everybody loved him. And he just died October 6th. Um, and I wish he would have, I wish he would have been alive to see this book, but mm -hmm. I got to, you know, talk to him right before he died along with, and I talked to Peter Hazrick before he died and one of my mm -hmm. other heroes. Yeah. And, um, but I just want to do a plug for Bob because I kind of did this book for him because, you know, so much of the art, um, you know, he had his hands in before he retired. Well, and it's one of the things I think is a little unsung are the art dealers that do really affect and change markets and bring attention to artists that may never have been seen, you know, spend money to, you know, do books like they're doing, you're doing that helps, again, bring, you know, to the forefront, these artists that um, there's a, you know, a, a group of people who love them, but there's other people who don't know anything about these guys, right? Yeah. Or girls. And yep. so, and part of that is art dealers and Drummond clearly is one of those leaders in the field. Um, and he was an interesting guy for sure. Uh, I agree. Yeah. He's that. the one that got me going on Goodwin. You know, I said, you need to do a book on Philip R. Goodwin. Then I, I find out, uh, you know, um, I mean, he's one, one of the great, you know, uh, trained by Howard Pyle. Um, it, you know, people back East, he's like a God. He's like, Dixon and you know and which I didn't know I I did uh, for a span there I did talk at the pre to West show at the National Cowboy and Western Heritage Museum what it's called now um, but I, I did a bunch of pre to West talks you know in June and I thought boy you know I've done one on Russell um, down here and good one you know at a sporting artist at this and I couldn't believe it. I I must have sold. I had people lined up for hours buying that book because everybody said, "Oh yeah, I remember uh, his images on you know calendars we had when right. we were a little kid." Right. And then right. they had the year of the cowboy, and of all the cowboy artists they could have picked, there it was their big anniversary, whatever the year of the cowboy, and they picked a Philip R. Goodwin cowboy image when things are quiet, with the cowboy kind of laying on the hillside with his horse, mm. and. And so that that's all Bob Drummond. I would have never done that without him. That's so. amazing. And so what do you collect? So because you're a collector too, and this show is about collectors as well. Um, so I collect sporting art, of course, um, mainly Goodwin, Frank Stick. Um, and I have a lot of photography, a lot of L.A. Huffman and some other artists, some Curtis. I've got a Glacier Park room. That has I did a book on John Ferry, who is the big right. landscape artist, and so I have uh, I have a little uh, Dixon, the flathead brave one, you know, the little flathead 1909 laying on his side. Oh yeah, I know that. Um, that's in my book, and I was able to get that years later. Um, so I collect a lot of Russell's fr uh, friends, like you know Barine and and uh, some of the local artists. Uh, around Montana that, um, you know, that he was friends with and, uh, like Mar and Marchand, the New York illustrator and Will Crawford, who brought him to New York for the first time. Some of, some of that, and I've got some Russell things, some, some, a uh, few couple bronzes and oh, that's good. They're, other they're, paintings. They're hard to like get. That. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. would think if you write a book about 
a man two books on Russell, I guess, that you instinctively want to have some of his artwork around you, even if it is incredibly valuable at times, that it would be unnatural because you know, you learn and know so much about him, including what are the best time frames, what are the, you know, the subject matters that are most interesting. So it seems like it would be unnatural that that would be one that you'd want to be involved in. Um, but you never had the interest to go, let me be a dealer in this as well, because you have the knowledge for sure. Well, I, you know, I have, um, purchased a, a, quite a few pieces that I sold to at auction. Yeah. I've never been a dealer where I, you know, hey, call me and we'll make out a deal. I've usually sold them at auction. And um, and so it kind of builds on itself as I sell things at auction and make money, then I, yeah. you know, <laughs> kind of a, that sort of a thing. You, yeah. And, um, uh, but you get to the point, you know, like I said, and, and you well know more than I do that a lot of people that get excited about art, they either have a wooden eye as Drummond used to say, or they just buy something to buy it. And then they spend a lot of time, um, you know, massaging their collections as, as they understand the art better and the artists. And, um, you know, you, you let some of that stuff go that really isn't great. And you try only keep the great stuff because you can only keep so much. So. And are you still buying? Um, not right now. I've um, put a little bit moratorium, my makes, which makes my wife happy. <laughs> <laughs> she keeps going, you're doing that, you're buying that. What are you doing for? But she's very loving and supporting. So, I, you know, you've got to have a wife that, uh, you know, puts up with this. But, uh, you know, one of the, one of the, shout outs I'd like to make and you mentioned him and we we've talked about him a little was Edward Curtis yes who I profile him in the book and I really believe you know it's really hard to say oh what's your what's the greatest artist because you know you got Maynard with his desert landscapes and you've got Moran with a different and Russell and Remington but I think if I had to pick one artist who I admire the most of any and I I love all these artists I, I would say it was Edward Curtis because I look at his, the North American India and the 20 volumes and the 20 portfolios. And you look at that and you just, I, I don't know how he did one of those books. And, and, I, and his life is fascinating, Timothy Egan, Short Nights of the Shadow right. Catcher. And, uh, and so I, I admire probably Curtis the most of any of, of the artists and photographers that I've come up. I mean, he was just amazing. And, uh, right. I don't There's a lot of books out on him. Yeah, Egan's book really changed my whole sensibility of who this guy was. And um, yeah, and I encourage people to go read Timothy Egan's book. You know, and, and just a shout out for Curtis. The, the Curtis Found, Foundation um, has a website and it's amazing. They have all things about him and, and different documents and resources and um they are documenting every set that's still around of, of uh, Curtis's and his sets, full sets, I think are really a lot rarer than people think. I, I figured from their table and it's not, they're still working on it, but I think there's less than 15 original sets, numbered hmm. sets, um, full sets and portfolios that are not in uh, museums. So it is really, really rare because so many of these, uh, especially the portfolios got broken up and people right. sold the, uh, just more the money. Photographers separately. Yeah, they'd, you know, sell them and put a frame around them. But anyway, I, I, I think Curtis, uh, his life is, is absolutely amazing. Well, there's going to be a big show that's coming up for Curtis. I don't know if you know about this, but at the Scottsdale Museum of the West. Um, I don't. That, I didn't know yeah, that. It's going to be a phenomenal uh, show. Tim Peterson's collection is going to be shown. And Richard Lampert's helping with that, uh, co-curating or curating it maybe. And um, yeah, it's gonna be one of those amazing shows. It'll be a, a monumental show. And that'll be, I think maybe in August is when it comes up. So you'll really wanna, you'll wanna put yeah. that on schedule and everyone else should put it on their schedule too. Yeah, the For sure. Dixon show comes down and I think the Curtis show goes up. So I'm- They're I'm really with, getting some great exhibitions there. They are, it's, a, it's an They're amazing- doing a great job. Yeah. Yeah, Fox has done an amazing job as has Trisha uh, Losher, who I'm going to interview after this next week or this week. I'm going to interview Trisha. So yeah, no, it's fun <laughs> doing this, and um, 
you know, having somebody like yourself on who's really dedicated the last part of their life to history, Native American stories, um, is really a wonderful thing that you've done that. And you're clearly not done with it. You probably have another five or 10 books in you, hopefully. Um, yeah, any project you're working on right that, now? <laughs> is there a project you're you working know, on? Now? Not right now. Not right now. I'm kind of, uh -huh. it's, it's been about uh, a big one book every other year here for a while. And so it's, I think I'm going to take a break. Yeah, it's hard. So, I think people don't realize unless something else gets me excited, which could happen. Yeah. It, it, well, they will. <laughs> I can assure you. No, I, I don't think people have any, any. Yeah, I, I just don't think folks. Well, it's like anything unless you've done it. Um, you don't know what it's like to go through. It's like everything in life. You know, it's unless you've been there. Um, it, it, but, you know, I don't expect people to go, oh, boy, that was a lot of work. You. I, I just say I feel fortunate I'm to be in a position where I can do what I do and kind of move on. You know, most of the books after I do, um, I don't look, look at them for a long time. I uh, maybe look at them once and uh, then I kind of just set it aside and let it rest for a while. And I kind of graze on it after a while, but I, yeah. I kind of, I've had my fill of that uh, dish. Yeah. No. Well, it's hard after you've done spent a lot of energy, a lot of effort. You know, you have to read it a million times. You're like, okay, I'm ready to do something else or move on. And um, so I totally understand. But there will be something. So now I'm going to start thinking about things that you should write <laughs> write about. And I'll just well, you know what 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 we need you. to do here is sometime I should interview you. <laughs> well, when you get your podcast, let me know. <laughs> I'll be happy to do it. When you have your podcast, I'll be happy to do it. <laughs> we all want to know about the medicine man more. Ah, there's not that about, much. And it comes know. out a little. It it comes out a little. I, I'm kind of constructing you. I know Vietnam was a big deal for you because I is. know you bring it up with almost everybody you interview. Yes. Um, so. It's pivotal, I think. I think it's pivotal for it our is. generation and how it affected us and how we thought and what we did and how our political views were and how we see America. And it, it stuck like a knife and it hasn't gone away for any of us. We all you know, know people that passed away from it. You know, I was in the military, but I have my own views about it. Um, so yeah, no, I, I, I find it interesting. I think that when I do these interviews, one of the reasons I like to go back and, and kind of fill in and find out how things affect people is it makes me understand what motivates people to do it. I mean, to me, I think one of the biggest, one of the most interesting things, and, I've, and you're the second person that I've heard this from, John Coleman was the other person that when their father died at a young age at 56 for you and John for his father was 41, it really solidified this is a point in my life i need to do something different or explore it or whatever and uh, we wouldn't know that about you if we don't do these things well you know it's, it's interesting i i often wonder why i do this and there was a ken burns it might have been on 60 minutes a couple of weeks ago and he was talking about it and his mother died when he was a child and years later someone said you know why you do this is you're trying to bring back the past when your mother was alive and recreate any you know it was an aha moment for me and when i listened to that on tv about ken burns i thought you know there's a component of that in me too um you know the past back to where when my father was living and and even further back but i think that has some connection there that i haven't totally figured out yet yeah for sure i mean you said it actually you said, I'm sorry, I didn't get to have those conversations as an adult with my father. Right. You know, and so maybe you're having those conversations through your books. Well, I did dedicate the Philip R. Goodwin book to him. I just said to my father, Donald Peterson, a hardware store owner from Plentywood, Montana. And, you know, it's funny, um, and we've all seen this. I've, I've been around a lot of educated, very well-educated people. Um, I was on the board of the research board of uh, the term dermatology society and, and used to meet in Washington DC with the chairman of Harvard, Yale and all that. 
uh, you know, I saw, I was picked as the resident in the country for that. And, and, but I go back to the people that were my father and his friends. And I, I think they're every bit as intelligent and, and uh, smart as any of those people. They just didn't, a lot of them didn't have the opportunity or the money to, or the luck to, and a lot of it, a lot of this we all do, you and me and everybody else that have had some success, a lot of it's luck being in the right place. I mean, you and I could have ended up in Vietnam and be killed. Um, yeah. We could have had different parents. We could have, you know, so um, I think we all need to not feel too proud of ourselves and realize that a lot of this is luck and the right genetics and the right family. Yeah. And, and maybe the right just, time in, in yeah. on this earth. Yeah. Just a moment, the right moment yeah. that you live. And, uh, you know, you clearly have a connection to where you grew up. You wrote a book using all the characters of people that you grew up with, you know, and, you know, I, I wonder about your right. father selling those prints in his, you know, uh, you know, hardware store that there's a connection to art there that that's goes deeper than I think maybe, or maybe not, maybe you do recognize it, but I'm sure there's a, that connection of those things, just those prints in that store. Well, he was, he was a very smart man, and at, in our house, he had got all the magazines, the Saturday Evening Post, and Argus, and Sports Illustrated, and, and all the hunting and fishing, and, and time, and life, and look, we had all those. So I grew up with a rich collection of literature that, you know, I ate up as a little kid, and, you know, I, he, he provided that, and he was very much focused on me going to medical school <laughs> by the time I was in first grade, uh -huh. um, so he moved me along what do you what would you think he would think about you being a writer now of art oh, i think i think he would he would like it you know he was always very supportive of um you know anything i did and he, and he was not critical when i you know screwed up uh you know that first year that first quarter at montana state i went to a foot i always think of this i went to a football game and had a bottle 95 cent bottle of any green springs in the in the stands um and uh, it was my buddy was standing next to me on an army jacket on my hair was on my shoulders uh -huh. and someone took a picture of it i was holding up the wine bottle oh, and boy. it ended up in the montana state uh yearbook on the front of the sports section it was like sports a, a dedication and they have me with the bottle of and that got back to my counselor in high school and but my dad, you know, that was uncomfortable, but my dad, uh, he was very nice about it. So I, I've been, uh -huh. I've tried to um, be like that and I get too critical. Uh -huh. so. Well, it shows, it shows you're a very humble man. I love that about <laughs> you. You're an erudite as well. And not only what you've done in dermatology, which I think people, you know, when they look at your books, and I hope they do, I hope they go and read a bunch of your books and listen to your books, or well, uh, you're not, you're not on Audible, you need to get on Audible, by the way. Um, but uh, I know, I almost did that with um, one thing is to plug is American Trinity, uh, Jefferson Custer and the Spirit of the West, which yes. is on Kindle, but that is one of my, my favorite books I've ever done, because it really does explore uh, racism. Um, with the focus out west, but it does have the Civil War in it, and it's a big book, you know, seven over seven hundred pages, eighteen hundred end notes, and eight hundred <laughs> references. That <laughs> thing took me, and I learned. Boy, did I learn a lot! I, I bet. Yeah, yeah, that was a, that was a fun one. So, yeah, do that audible. You should have it on audible. That one. <laughs> I, yeah, know. You should. I know. Yeah, I've got the. I've got a perfect guy for you. So when you're ready, just let me know. He can read it beautifully for you. So, and it, you'll be surprised. It Alrighty. takes a lot of effort on those too. When you have to, Good. when you do the audible, Good. you have to follow along with the, with the reader, oh. you know, the, the person who's doing it and make sure they pronounce every word correctly. Yeah, there, well, there's, that would be a challenge on that one, but it might be worth, worth it. <laughs> <laughs> Definitely would be worth it. Any last parting words you'd like to say to the people there who are out there? where they can find your books. You don't really have a website for those, right? No, I just, you know, I, I do the books. I give all the money away. Um, the fortunately, like the Clark book I did last, it sold out in, in one afternoon. And mm -hmm. uh, so I haven't, you know, I, I just didn't want to get into that side of it. I just yeah. am doing this for 
once I start getting a website and all that, it, I just don't, I don't want to do it. But um, this new book, you know, will be available from the Coeur d'Alene Art Auction. I'm sure it'll be available on Amazon at some point. Um, you know, and hopefully all the museums, most of the museums have been nice enough to pick the other ones up. Um, this is definitely one that every Western art museum in the country should have in their gift shop. If they're going to have one book that you would want to present a Martian on what was Western American art, I think when people see this, their jaws are going to drop. It is by far my best book I've ever done. Well, and that's 122 really uh, biographies? 100, 120 profiles, seven essays on the American West, sporting art, um, illustration art, you know, and, and romantic art and all of it. I mean, it's got anything you want to know about Western art. And the index is like a mile long. I mean, it's, the, it's a huge index. I told them, don't spare anything. So it's four columns on one page, 12 by 12, 12 and it's like 30 page index. I mean, it's, it's got every, it's even got, it's got Norman Rockwell's dog Pitter um, in it. And I thought, wow, now they're getting down to the nitty gritty. Um, <laughs> that sounds tortuous to me to do an index that long. Oh my God. I know, I, I don't understand how they do it. And, uh, but really helpful because they, they cross match stuff. Oh yes, left out an F in Georgia O'Keeffe. And it's like, oh my goodness, sir. Um, you know, it's not the arts student league, it's art student league. You put yeah, an yeah. S on, in one area and you left it off in another and they, because they cross reference all that stuff. And by the time they get done with you, you feel like you've been in the ring with Muhammad Ali, you just feel like a fool. <laughs> but it's amazing this stuff. Uh, I could go on and on about well, that. Sounds like a wonderful book. I will definitely get a copy and I want it one inscribed to me when it when you get there. Uh, well, if you said if you'd wanted to say one last thing, it would be yeah. directed towards you and and I and I think you understand it, but I, I think how important what you do um, for the whole uh, Western American art uh, community. I mean I've I've watched a ton of your podcasts and I love the way you interview people and uh, and bring out a lot of behind the scenes things. And they're so important uh, for keeping this genre going that we all love so much. Uh, you know, people like visual things and uh, books are fine, uh, but I think you're reaching a lot more people than any of us. So, you know, to me, you're the, the kingpin. You're, the, uh -huh. you're one of my uh -huh. heroes, so. Uh -huh. Well, I appreciate it. I definitely wouldn't consider myself the kingpin of anything, but. Uh, I do think it is important to capture these voices. I do. I think it's very important. And, um, and it's a media that can reach other younger people who will potentially go, you know, this is a field that's very interesting. And it's an American field for sure. And yes. how can I be a part of it, whether it's a writer like yourself, or a dealer or an artist or a collector, you know, that we're all very passionate about we've given our lives. I mean, you get you stop medicine to write books about native arts western arts and uh, i've done the same and we're both very pleased that we did and we're happy and that's why you know we're, we're sharing the gospel and the gospel is you know the west yeah very well said yep so i look forward to uh getting to see you sometime in the future i don't know when i might come out if you're going to do a book signing to quarter lane auction i might come out just for that well i'll definitely be there and uh the medicine man from the north can meet the medicine man from the south and yep. have a powwow, maybe. Are there any other guys like or girls out there like us that have done this with medicine? I'm not sure if there are. Um, you know, I don't know of any. I'm sure there must be. Um, I, I assume there are, and I apologize for those who are out there that I'm not reaching out to. But yeah, I'm. I don't. I don't know. I, um, I don't know any in Western American art, but I'm sure there are in other areas there. Yes, there, there is are. one. There is one. But, he was an obstetrician um, out of Montana, and his name escapes me. And he was extremely knowledgeable, who you would have known. Um, and his son is. Oh, Mark. Van Kirk Nelson. Thank you, Van Kirk Nelson. Yeah, and, and Van Kirk was one of my other mentors, huge in my life. I mean, I could go through Van Kirk. I talked to him right shortly before. Before he died, he was a dear friend, hiked Glacier Park with him, um, loved his Glacier Gallery. I have several very important paintings that I got from Kirk. And yeah, he was bigger than life. I mean, right, I'd go yeah. up there, he'd have three or four cell phones going off and delivering yeah. babies. 
He would yeah. rescue people by helicopter up in Glacier Park. He, you know, he had Glacier Gallery. He was a huge art dealer. And, yeah, he was. Um, yeah, I bought stuff. Yeah, he did. Yeah, and he did a book, Montana in Miniature, on Seltzer's Miniatures. Yeah. Um, that Cole Cole had him do and are now in the Gilcrease. And, uh, but yeah, Van Kirk Nelson and the Nelson family were fabulous in yeah. Kalispell. Yep, that's it. I knew there was one and I, I shouldn't ever leave him out. See, he would have been one that would have been amazing to have on the podcast too. Oh yeah, you know, and, and that's the great thing about your podcast now that as people pass on, they can right. look back and, because and, there's so many people, you know, you and I have both had from, you know, Bill Burford to Peter Hazrick to Van Kirk right. Nelson to Paul Mesa to Bob Drummond, um, you know, Steve Rose, you know, yeah. all these guys that I knew really, really well and were wonderful mentors to me. And I'm probably leaving out some I shouldn't. Ginger Renner. Yeah. I did. I spent 25 hours with Ginger, going to do her biography, and then that didn't work out. But I sat in her home, beautiful home in Camelback. Um, and yeah. and interviewed her, you know, just like you're interviewing. I interviewed her eight hours a day for days. Yeah, and, and uh, incredible story. I mean, we could talk an hour on her adventures. And uh, yeah, yeah so. those are the kind of people you want to capture before they're gone. So you should do well, something with that if you have all that information. You should do something with her, with a book or something. Yeah. Well, she, you know, she died a few years ago, and and. Yeah. So many, just so many of the folks like that are, aren't around now. And they, when they die, they just, you know, so much of that history, the early history of the art dealers, it was such a different world back then before the internet. Yep. Yeah, there's, it's almost like postmodern and, you know, contemporary art. I mean, you have a cutoff from when the internet started in 90, you know, five, four, whatever, when it really kind of started. Um, what happened before and then what happens after and a lot of yeah. the great dealers are pre-internet and never got to the internet, never will. Some are still alive. Some have made the transition and like Al Anthony, Adobe Gallery, he's was, did a fantastic job. And then some people like me kind of bridged both worlds. So, uh, uh, you know, and hopefully I'm taking it to Which that Which is hard world. to do. I mean, you gotta be committed for that. That's, that's not easy. Um, I have a lot of friends that they won't even get on, the, on their laptops. I send them, a piece or something I've written and they have, you know, their wife has to print it out and right. uh, you know, my friends in Montana, the wife has to print them out. And so they'll, they'll read them. They're, they are, they will not touch a laptop or have anything yeah. to do with the internet. Well, they're and, scared. Uh, they they know, those folks are still around. Yeah. They're afraid. Yeah. And I understand that. Yeah. But yeah. you know, as a physician, I you had, you, you had to use the internet, you had to use computers, all that. So yeah, you know, you're not afraid. The person who got me said you need a computer was my mother. So <laughs> back in like the eighties, probably she's like late eighties, you know, you need to be getting into this. We still have, a, I still have an Apple too somewhere. Yeah. Uh, I remember my neighbor got one of those and I couldn't believe it, but that could do. Uh, and, all right. Uh, well, I'll let you get back to farming and enjoying yourself. And <laughs> you know, I'm sure there's another book that'll come out of you in the near future, but you do have to get that motivation. I understand it. It's that spark. And, uh, but the spark will hit. Yeah, I only like to do books where I really get the spark hits. I, I don't want to do, I could never have someone call me and say, would you do this book for me? And it's like, no, I don't want to do that. And I've had a ton of people contact me. Hey, you need to do this book. Can we do it? And, and I just like, I really don't care about that person or I don't have any interest in doing that. I mean, you know, your time is precious and you want to do, you know, like your passion with Dixon. I mean, who wouldn't be passionate about Dixon? Just yeah. fabulous. No, um, but no. you got to have it. The, you got to have it or it just, or it sits dead and you just, you can't put in the effort and the work and, and you don't leave yeah. anything that's of quality anyway. So, you know, I did, I waited a long time to do my book on Dixon just because I wanted to say something that was unique and hadn't been said before and add to the body of the language. Cause Don Haggerty had done so many wonderful books that, you know, it's a yeah. tough subject to grab, but I finally felt like I had enough things that I could add to the dialogue that it was worth doing. So. Yeah, well, it's fabulous and congratulations. <laughs> I mean, it's a, a great, I mean, if you had to do a book on an artist, uh, you know, a painter, um, who, who's more interested in Dixon with all his styles? I mean, yeah, it's, it's amazing. He, Talking about a guy that had courage. I mean, we could have a whole thing on, you know, his transformations and all the different art 
methods yeah. he used. Yeah, he did. Yeah, he was a very interesting guy. We should have something like that, a, a symposium, a Dixon <laughs> symposium. That would be very interesting, actually. I would love that just because I would learn stuff. I always learn stuff, right? Sure. I mean, 1924, you know, that Russell went and got his photograph with Dorothea Lang. I did not know that. Now I know that, you know, so that's just a little piece of the puzzle that I wish I had have known about a year ago. <laughs> yeah, she did three or four that oh, I think the Oakland Museum, Art Museum has yeah. copyright for, but I got mine out of the Eamon Carter and they're beautiful yeah. images. Yeah, I, you know, I, somewhere in the back of my mind, I knew something of that, but you know, it just didn't solidify until you mentioned it. So, you know, that's the thing. You're learning, you're always learning. You're always- Oh yeah, you can't. Together. And you know, how many books I've done where I get done and then someone gets, oh, well, why didn't you put this in there? Yeah. And you go, oh, geez, why didn't, right. why didn't I put that in there? I didn't know about it, you know? Yeah, well, but, I found one today. I won't forget it, by the way. It's already, uh, I already cataloged <laughs> it mentally down into my head. <laughs> <laughs> well, the Charles M. Russell photographing the legend has the photos of Dorothea Lange. Really yeah, I'm nice going to get that book. And where can I it, get that book? Uh, you can get it on Amazon. Okay. And and a lot of people have told me they think it's the best biography ever done on Russell. And the, the treat is, it's as long a text as any biography ever on Russell. People look, oh, well, it's an art book. But the text right. itself is longer than any other biography done on Russell. Plus, you get the value of hundreds of photographs through his whole life. Yeah, um, I'm buying it. Charles today, Loomis is in there and yeah, and uh, you know, Will James and on and on and on. As soon Lots as I finish this, green. I'm going to buy one. That is the first, as soon as, as I click in, which is in a second, I'm going to go right to Amazon and, and buy the book. <laughs> yeah, it's got the black, uh, yeah. black image. I don't know if you can yeah, see it. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, send me a, again, send me an image of what you want, some Russell stuff, and we'll put it in the podcast. All righty. All, All right. right, very good. Stay safe. Yeah, and, you too. And we'll talk sometime soon. I'm, I have a feeling we'll be talking more. We I should be. We should yeah, be. I yeah, agree. Call me sometime. All right. Yeah. Thank you so much yeah, for letting me it. talk with you. I yeah, appreciate it. I learned it. a lot and it was really fascinating. And congratulations for just spending a, a life well lived. You know, that's hard. Not everybody does it. You did it. Congratulations. Luck. Luck and genetics. And Helen. <laughs> Perseverance, my friend. I think it's perseverance. And yeah. you know that time's going like this and you recognize it and you recognize it from as being a little kid and all the way and you're still doing it. So kudos. Keep going. <laughs> all right. I'm going to order a book. <laughs> Good. And, and I would maybe suggest you order five because I, you know, family members all would love one. For Christmas. And it's Christmas, right? And, and all the proceeds go to the Russell Museum. So. All right. Okay. There you go. <laughs> I might get more than one. Yeah, but right. I'm definitely getting one for myself. So, all right, take care and we'll talk yeah. soon. All right, there. Bye. We need your support for the Medicine Man Gallery channel. So make sure to click the subscribe button and tap the little bell icon to be notified when we upload a new video, which we do every morning on Wednesday and Friday. See you soon.